Welcome to Citizens Climate Radio. In this show, we highlight people's stories, we celebrate your successes, and together we share strategies for talking about climate change. I'm your host, Peterson Toscano. Welcome to Episode 20 of Citizens Climate Radio, a project of Citizens Climate Education. This episode is airing on Monday, January 22nd, 2018. Towards the end of today's episode, you will hear our latest puzzler question. Yes, the puzzler is back. These questions are designed to help us become better communicators. You will hear a common question we climate advocates get in hopes of stumping us. Let's see if it stumps you. In the art house, I introduce you to playwright Chantal Bilodeau. Although most of her plays are set in the frigid Arctic, They are packed with warmth and passion. You will hear Chantal talk about her work and the creative process. She explains why theater is so important in helping people better understand climate change. You will also learn about a project that can help you bring quality climate change themed theater to your own community. But first, our main section. Most compelling stories have conflict moving the narrative along. Some might say we have had just a little too much conflict when it comes to climate change. My guest today, Grant Sams, tells us a story about Woodward, Oklahoma, an oil town with a lot of windmills. It was curious to me that a a town that ostensibly its entire identity was based on oil production would then identify itself as the wind energy capital. And and I did a little bit of digging and I found out that it was actually the local government that was saying that. And my thought was, oh, that must be to try to bring in these wind companies and this wind development. But that has to be at odds with the identity that the people of the town have. There's got to be conflict there and it's got to be juicy. And so I went to Woodward explicitly to try to document this. I mean, in a sociologic way, in a scientific way, but at the same time, I was like, oh, I want to, I want to dive into this. Grant shows up in Woodward, Oklahoma, and begins to get a lay of the land and the people who have lived on it for generations. If you know anything about Western Oklahoma, you know that it is oil country. That is, and I don't just mean they came to do that. That is why it was settled. It was settled and those towns were were built where they were built because there was oil nearby and there were depots for oil workers in the late 18, early 1900s that would move out from these towns, go to the oil fields, work, and then come back and that's where they would stay. And these places were booming. And they were they were places for misfits. They were places for families that were really rough in it. There were some of the famous uh, uh, outlaws and bank robbers of the time, Dillinger included, actually kind of sought refuge and would hide from the law in these these oil towns that were just so chaotic you could never figure out what was going on anyway. There were people literally sleeping underneath pool tables in bars as people were playing pool on the table above them because of all the people and the lack of infrastructure. So these towns were developed because there was oil. That's the only reason they exist. But in the last 10 years, they've seen an incredible increase in the amount of wind energy development that's gone on in that area. And the town is incredibly conservative. They do not believe in climate change. The whole thing is a liberal conspiracy by China to do whatever you know the intent of the, the hoax was and money for scientists and the whole bit. I met Grant this past fall at Washington College in the U.S. state of Maryland. What he discovered in Woodward, Oklahoma surprised me. It also gives me hope that Americans can transform their energy economy. But before we hear about Grant's discoveries, it's important to know more about him and his field of study. Grant is not a traditional environmentalist. He recognizes many players and many factors need to be considered when looking at environmental issues. He asks a vital question. How do environmental and social issues intersect and play off of each other? Because it's very rare that you have an issue that is entirely environmental in nature. 
whenever you address an environmental issue, you're always having to, to chase after some kind of social or political or economic solution to addressing that challenge. For instance, when I was an undergrad, we worked on a project looking at how different burning patterns for grazing land affected uh, cattle production and and then how that affected habitat for insects and for birds that lived on the tall grass prairie that was uh, unique to that area of Kansas that I was studying in. And that is inevitably social and political and economic because ultimately what we were asking local ranchers to do was change the way that they managed their rangeland in in such a way that wouldn't impact their 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 beef output but would be better for wildlife and better for insects and better as a uh, better for the ecosystem as a whole and we could then instead of just managing rangeland as this is where we produce beef it's we produce beef on this land but it's also a thriving ecosystem for a variety of native species that previously had been pushed out by methods of land management that weren't as beneficial on the whole. He explains that the farmers and the ranchers were very receptive to the new ideas. There's oftentimes a thought that people in rural spaces or that farmers and ranchers, they just want to do the job they have to do. And their job is to, you know, take something from the land and sell it on the market and make money and then, you know, rinse and repeat. It oftentimes gets overlooked that people that live in rural spaces and and farmers and ranchers, especially they have a connection to the land. They, they own the land that they work on, they live on that land, and they're a part of a larger community of people where that is also true. And so when you approach them and say, hey, we have some ideas, if you're interested in listening to them, that might lead to a healthier, more productive landscape on all fronts, they usually say, oh my goodness, yes, you know, tell, me, tell me what exactly you're talking about. And that's where we would, you know, come in with the, our tips on rangeland management. And it was actually tended to be received really, really well. In his current position at Washington College, Grant is doing climate and energy research in rural Maryland. I run a rural energy research project that looks at helping rural municipalities to understand how much energy they use how much carbon emissions that creates. And then I, we help them to bring that down through various clean energy and energy conservation methods. Grant's studies in sociology helps him to be observant and sensitive towards a community's identity. And there's a concept in sociology, there's a few, but there's, a, there's one in particular called sense of place. And it basically says that people don't just live in an area. They form connections and they form identities, both individual and collective, that are based on that place, that space, and the properties that are unique to it. These are powerful forces merging, identity and economy. When talking to Grant, it reminded me of the sheep and cattle wars in the western USA over a hundred years ago. Conflicts regarding grazing lands erupted between cattle ranchers and sheep herders. Shortly after the American War and up until the 1920s, these two factions fought over land rights. Their disagreements escalated into armed conflict. It led to the death of over 50 men and approximately 50,000 sheep were killed in the fighting. Now, Woodward, Oklahoma is an oil town, has been for a long time, So what did Grant discover when he did his graduate work there? How do the promoters of oil and wind coexist? I ended up going over the entire summer. I stayed in the entire summer in a trailer park in Woodward, Oklahoma. And I started started researching and interviewing people. And then I discovered very quickly that there was no conflict or, or exceedingly little conflict, which was surprising to me because these two things are supposed to clash. Oil has been king. In Woodward, yet Grant found there was room for wind, too. In fact, he met lots of people enthusiastic about the new wind technology. This seems to have a lot to do with identity. But at the same time, they were like, oh, wind energy, that's cool, bring it on. And that was incredibly confusing to me, because I'm like, no, 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 you guys are conservative, you're a red state, you don't believe in climate change, you drill for oil, wind is for the liberal blue Democrats that believe in climate change and want to save the planet. How do these things mesh together? 
And it confused me for a really long time until I interviewed one particular person. He mentioned something about how people oftentimes think that their oil past and their wind future have to conflict. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, well, yeah, that would be me. He said, the thing about that that people don't understand is that we're not really an oil town. We're an energy town. He said the the he, he went on to explain that the price of oil goes up and down based on, in his words, what some king over in Saudi Arabia says. But what he says doesn't change that the wind blows here. We've had the oil, we've had the gas, and now we have the wind. And if you'd be so inclined, I would also love to take the solar, and I would also like to take the geothermal and the hydroelectric, and is there anything else you can give us? Because as I came to find out, their identity was about producing energy and shipping it out to power an entire nation. The people of Woodward, while being, while it's true that it's incredibly conservative, it's incredibly rural, and climate denial is incredibly high, climate change is an incredibly dirty word. I found two people that would talk to me about it in whispers, even though we were the only two people in the room. That's, that's, how, that's how dirty of a word climate change was. And that's all true, but at the same time, almost nobody saw wind as a negative thing. Their connection to the place that they lived, it was about powering a nation both with food and with energy. And they would say, well, yeah, we have a ton of wind, so bring it on. This is what we do. It's who we are. And that, that ended up being the, the, the reason for the lack of conflict. Interestingly, these days in rural Maryland, Grant observes a strong resistance to installing wind turbines. Sense of self and long-held identities are clashing with renewable energy technologies. The area of rural eastern Maryland that I live in is seeing a lot of requests from developers who want to build uh, wind, both onshore and offshore, that want to build solar farms. And most of that energy is being cited here, but is meant to power, you know, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, the big cities. There are some people that want to see that change. There are some people that don't want to see that change. The There can be a lot of acrimony, really, over the, uh, the, the tension between those two groups. There's a lot of perception that the companies are trying to come in, they're trying to build and develop these projects and trample on the the wishes and the desires and the input that local people want to give these projects. The, the general objection that I hear in this area to building out clean energy is that we, we farm here. We have great farmland and we grow food for an entire nation. And you're going to tear that up to try to install a bunch of weird gizmos and gadgets that we don't really understand why that has to be here. You're, you're messing up who we are, and you're messing up this place. That's, that sense of place starts to come back into it. Grant is committed to seeing renewable energy take hold all over the USA, but he's also aware of the complications and challenges. Grant is looking at possible solutions. There are ways you can mitigate that. If it's for a local municipality, it makes it a little bit easier. If it's sited on what we call a brownfield, which is... A, a plot of land that maybe was used for industrial use or maybe pesticide production, chemical production. It's not good for growing food on. You can put clean energy there and people are a little more okay with it. So we're going to help towns to continue to, to look at their energy usage, but we're also going to start doing research in this part of the nation in trying to figure out how we can overcome those barriers. There's really two things we want. One is we know we need clean energy. And the thing about building solar and wind if you're going to try to replace fossil fuels with it is that they just take up more land area. You build one coal plant and you can produce gigawatts of energy on you know one multi-burner coal facility but in that same space if you were to put solar panels you would only replace a fraction of, of what you can produce. Now it's carbon free which is obviously the benefit but the logical consequence is that you need more surface area to build out that production. We want to see that build out, but at the same time, we don't want local communities to get trampled in the rush to develop that. 
I appreciate this care and thoughtfulness in engaging with communities. Grant wants to see progress without encouraging a clean energy sprawl across rural USA. Now, back in episode 17, I asked a puzzler question about windmills. Someone named Larry hates windmills. Why? Well, Larry thinks they look ugly. I received a lot of responses, including a lovely one from Jonathan Abbott. I thought it might be a good way to end this segment of the show with this clip. Jonathan lives in Wales in the United Kingdom. He tells Larry about a road trip he took across the USA and the many windmills he encountered all over Oklahoma. And I was struck by the sight of wind turbines next to an oil pump. You know, a pump jack. They're all over the the West. Um, Nodding donkey is another name for them. They seem to be useful. They're familiar, they're iconic, they're redolent of US industrial history. But are you really telling me that the, the elegant, silent, clean, modern turbine is somehow uglier than this noisy, smelly, dirty, wasteful bit of kit, which the pump jack is. It's not so great. Oklahoma now produces 28% of its power from wind and has the capacity to provide 10% of all U.S. energy. And this is the heart of Trump country, where people don't believe in climate change. They're not motivated mostly by the desire to reduce emissions. Like other states, its leaders see tapping the wind as an economic strategy. Wind energy is secure, it's clean, inexhaustible. The costs have plummeted in recent years. So even to the unromantic Midwesterner, even to you, Larry, and you might be a romantic, that is strangely beautiful. I'm looking at a photograph of it now. There it is, the nodding donkey and this beautiful array of wind turbines. If you want to learn more about Grant Sams and the work he's doing, visit his website, GrantSams.com. Sams is spelled with two M's, GrantSams.com. Now it is time for the art house. It's like going to a store and trying on clothes, but with the theater, you get to try on beliefs and values. Like, let me see, let me go along with this character and what they believe in and see if that works for me. It's a way of thinking about something not under pressure. You know, you don't have somebody who's saying, you need to do this, you need to to believe what I believe in. But you can, as an audience member, you can sit and experience those things and, and think about them for yourself and then make your own decisions. Today, we welcome Chantelle Bilodeau. Chantelle is a playwright originally from Quebec province in Canada. She now lives outside New York City. Her award-winning plays take on climate change. They are beautiful, original, and they're moving audiences all over the world. Although she initially studied film, Chantelle believes live theater experiences create special opportunities for audiences. I really like the live aspect of it. Also, to I have this trademark, I guess, with my plays where I tend to always put a non-human character on stage, which is something that can't be done as easily in film unless you go into animation. But I had characters that were cats, unborn children, imaginary people. I also have ice as a character. I have polar bears as characters. That's something I feel like you can do in theater, but not so easily in film. Something else you should know about Chantel's climate change-themed plays. They are set in very, very cold places. Chantel loves the Arctic. It plays a major role in her work. (laughs) Yes, yes, I'm in love with the Arctic. I went for the first time 10 years ago, and it's just such a fascinating place. Also, I'm from Canada, so I guess I'm used to a certain amount of cold, even though I hated it when I was there. It's not so much the cold, it's the landscape. You know, I live in in New York, so your view is blocked all the time. But when you go places where there aren't even trees, you can see so far 
to find these big expanses where almost nobody live the big sky and the big land and I, all of that I really love. While set in icy climates, Chantel's plays are warm, in fact, downright fiery when it comes to human conflicts. She adds even more conflict by giving the land, the sea, and animals voice and roles to play. Chantel is currently finishing a triptych, three plays, all set in the Arctic. Two are complete, and the third is currently under development. I've yet to see one of her plays on stage, but I read the first two plays, Sila and Forward. This is is riveting work, which is saying something. Climate change art can easily be clunky, preachy, and shaming. It can get so caught up in the facts that it misses the point. Not so with Chantel's work. Chantel has discovered something essential for every artist doing climate-related work. With art, especially with some narrative storytelling, which uh, theater is, you get to experience, depending on the project, you get to experience climate change on a more personal level. Like, how is it affecting somebody? It's a completely different way of approaching the the problem. And it's not about debating the problem. It's about understanding what it means and and figuring out what you can or want to do about it. Chantel's play, Forward, presents a poetic and humorous history of Norway. Reading it, I marveled over the story Chantel crafted, original, compelling. I asked Chantel about the play and her artistic process. Chantel outlined three major steps she took in writing the play. The first was research. And I started off looking at Free Jeff Nansen, who held the record of sailing closest to the North Pole for about five years. So it was a three-year expedition. He went from 1893 to 1896. The next step in Chantel's process required experiencing the setting. And then I went on an artist residency on a sailboat where we sailed for 10 days around the Svalbard Islands and into all of the fjords. So it was very very much about the water again. Finally, and perhaps hardest of all, Chantel wrote and rewrote and then reworked the play over and over again. It was this intricate structure where the Nansen only appeared at the end in one scene. It was The play was sort of working towards that. It, it wasn't quite working. Then it, I changed it. That play went to so many different structures. It started as a, a play that had 10 scenes. Each scene was about 10 minutes long. The characters changed in, everything, so in every scene, so there was no real through line. The play wasn't holding together very well. Then I changed that. The scene became much shorter, and I integrated Nansen into more of the scenes, and that still wasn't enough. And then eventually the play became, among other things, it became a love story between um, Nansen and the character of Ice. And that's how, the, in the end, it, that's how it stayed. The first play in her Arctic cycle is called Sila. Sila examines the compelling interest shaping the future of the Canadian Arctic and local Inuit population. It's set on Baffin Island in the territory of Nunavut. The play follows a climate scientist, an Inuit activist and her daughter, two Canadian Coast Guard officers, an Inuit elder, and two polar bears. They see their values challenged. Their lives become intricately intertwined. Now, as an artist, I know it's always scary putting work like this out into the world. So I asked Chantel how audiences have been responding. It's different depending on where the work is presented. For example, Sila, the first production of Sila was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The production was a partnership between Underground Railway Theater and MIT. So a lot of the audience was scientists and people who were very educated. So they responded a lot to the policy aspect of the play. And then the same play was presented in Anchorage a few years later in Alaska, and there are some indigenous characters in the play. And that's what came out most strongly there because of the indigenous people who live in Alaska and could relate to the indigenous characters in the play who were from Canada and commented actually on how similar the issues were. In addition to creating her own work for stage, Chantal has been instrumental in bringing artists together who address climate change. She created the website artistandclimatechange.com. 
I felt very lonely because I couldn't find anybody in my immediate circle that was doing the same kind of work. And I kept thinking, this, I'm not, you know, that special. There's got to be other people out there who are doing this kind of work. So I started the blog as a way of trying to find who the other artists were, both trying to create a little bit of a community so we would know each other and have each other as a resource, but also a place where other people could find us. Because I also imagined that if I was longing to find artists doing climate change work, there must have been other artists or even people outside of the art who were interested in finding those people. And so if I could gather a lot of us in one place, then maybe it would be useful. Chantal and some of her climate artist peers have also created opportunities to bring quality theater to communities all over the world, including yours. This is a project that happens every other year. We commission 50 writers from around the world to write very short plays, five-minute plays about climate change. And then we make this collection of plays available to whoever wants to put up an event in that time window um, between October and November to sort of coincide with the United Nations Cup meetings. This project will take place again in fall of 2019. Check it out for yourself to see how easy it would be to bring some of these short plays to your community. ClimateChangeTheaterAction.com That's ClimateChangeTheaterAction.com Theater is spelt the fancy way, with an R-E at the end. You can learn more about Chantelle over at her website, cbilido.com, cbilido.com, or do a simple Google search for The Arctic Cycle Art, and you will find her. I'm always looking for fresh ideas for the art house. If you want to share your art or your favorite climate artist, feel free to contact me, radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. Before we end our show, it is time for our monthly puzzler question. I have a good one that is all too common of a question we face in our climate work. Here goes. You're at a community event talking to a neighbor. Let's call him Greg. You reveal your passion about climate change and climate solutions. Greg looks you up and down and says, So I guess you don't use any fossil fuels yourself? You don't drive a car, travel by plane, or heat and cool your home? What are you actually doing to address climate change in your life? Hmm. Sounds like Greg may not be asking an honest question. Almost sounds more like an accusation. So, what do you say to Greg when he asks, what are you actually doing to address climate change in your life? How do you answer the question while also addressing the accusation? Send me your answers, leave your name, contact info, and where you're from. Get back to me by February 15th, 2018. You can email your answers to radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. And I love, I tell you, I love getting voicemails and sharing those with people. So feel free to leave a voicemail of three minutes or less at the following number, 570-483-8100. Nine four, plus one if calling from outside the USA. That number again is 570-483-8194. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Citizens Climate Radio. The show is written and produced by me, Peter Toscano. Other technical support from Ricky Bradley. Social media assistance from Ashley Hunt Monterano, Flannery Winchester, and Steve Volk. Moral support from Madeline Para. All the music we use on the show is licensed, unless otherwise specified. Please be sure to share Citizens Climate Radio with your friends. Wherever you listen to podcasts, just look for Citizens Climate Lobby. We're on iTunes, Podbean, Google Play, TuneIn, and Stitcher Radio. You can also listen at northernspiritradio.org. And feel free to join the discussion that we're having over at the Citizens Climate Radio Facebook group page. You can also follow us on Twitter at Citizens C Radio. That's Citizens, the letter C, Radio, at Citizens C Radio. To see info about our puzzler and to find links to our guest, visit citizensclimatelobby.org. Scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, and on the bottom left, you'll see a link for Citizens Climate Radio. Just look at episode 20 notes and you'll hear everything you need to know. 
Citizens Climate Radio is a project of Citizens Climate Education.